27, as the snow piled high and stocks of coal ran low, David Weitzman, Labour MP for Stoke Newington, was convicted of conspiracy to break wartime rationing laws. His family firm, a toilet paper supplier, had falsely claimed to be a lipstick wholesaler and profited from the Board of Trade's allowance scheme, which excluded certain products, including lipstick, from the strict <coughs> controls. Weitzman served five months in Wormwood Scrubs, where there was no heating, before his sentence was quashed on appeal. He returned to the House of Commons and went on to enjoy a long career without further transgressions before retiring in 1979, a few weeks shy of his 80th birthday, the last MP of the 20th century to have been born in the 19th. The lipstick case, as it was called at the time, is historically significant on a number of counts. Before the parliamentary expenses scandal of 2009, when five MPs were sent to prison, Weizmann was one of only four serving MPs since the Victorian era to have been convicted of financial irregularity. He was in notorious company. His fellow fraudsters included Horatio Bottomley in 1922, John Stonehouse in 1976, and Peter Baker, perhaps the least well known, in 1954. That's Baker's autobiography written shortly before he died in the early 1960s. But Weizmann is the only MP to have resumed his career on release, his name having been cleared. We might gloss, sorry, the lipstick case uh, further, I promise no more puns. Weitzman's alleged offence of made up, make up, sorry, that's the last one, <laughs> <laughs> only came to light because private information was supplied to the police by a member of the public. At the time, there was no other way of calling out MPs suspected of unethical behaviour. Indeed, until 1974, as we all know, there was no formal requirement that MPs declare their outside financial interests. And to this day, despite a flurry of new codes of conduct and forms of oversight brought in since the 1990s, the UK Parliament remains one of the more light-touch democracies in the world when it comes to regulating the ethics and public standards of its members. Unlike many professions, there are no background checks required Criminal convictions are no bar to becoming an MP unless the sentence was longer than 12 months. For a local councillor in the UK, you will know it is much tougher. A three-month sentence disqualifies you from a local authority, although the slate is wiped clean after five years. When it comes to declaring financial interest, the Westminster Code of Conduct, which in its current version dates from 2017, is less demanding than the codes of other countries, as extensive but less demanding. MPs are required to make an annual submission of their, quote, financial interests, meaning earnings, donations, gifts, employment of family, and income from property. If newly elected, the submission must include information from the preceding 12 months. By contrast, the European Parliament requires details of all personal interests, that's the phrase of its MEPs, from the previous five years. In the USA, members of the House of Congress must make an annual de declaration of all their assets and liabilities, with the exception of the value of their main residence, and they must support this by updated bank statements and details of shares transactions. When it comes to the business of the UK Parliament, that is to say debates, questions and the passage of legislation, there are also subtle differences. The Westminster rule is that MPs must only declare if they will receive, quote, a financial benefit from the measure under discussion. This contrasts with other legislatures where the definition of interest is much broader, prohibiting contributions on any matter in which the representative has a personal interest as opposed to an expectation of a reward. Now, undoubtedly, the landscape has changed a great deal since the John Paulson affair of 1972, particularly since the Cash for Questions, Cash for Questions episode of the mid-1990s and the revelations about duck houses, moats, adult TV subscriptions and the like in 2009. But as we are reminded by the case of Owen Patterson last autumn, together with the discussions in the House of Commons just last month on second jobs for MPs, 
the issue of the ethical standards of Parliament does not go away. The relevant chapters from David Hine and Gillian Peel's 2016 book give a sense of the problem. They refer to the slow erosion of self-regulation in the House of Commons, of reluctant reform in the House of Lords, and what is perhaps most perplexing, particularly in the light of the theme of today's event, is that reform of the civil service has been almost continuous since the 19th century, whilst Parliament, which after all passed the legislation that regulates the civil service, has only changed its ethics in fits and starts. So the poor purpose of my talk this morning is to look at MPs' ethics within a longer term historical perspective, offering a series of suggestions as to why it has taken Parliament so long to reform its behaviour. Surprisingly little has been written on, public, uh, on Parliament and public standards. Most studies of corruption uh, focus on public office, not elected representatives. We know more about the misdeeds of ministers than the misconduct of MPs. Recently, quantitative historians have begun to fill that gap, mining a lot of fascinating data about MPs as company directors across the late 19th and 20th century. Uh, centuries. But as Mark Philp and uh, Elizabeth David Barrett have pointed out, uh, measuring the incidence of corruption is not the same as explaining how it works or how it is deemed defensible. So along with more nuanced definitions, as, as, as Liz and Mark provide in that article, of what we mean by corruption now, we also need to understand how corruption was viewed in the past, if indeed it was thought of as corruption. So the rest of my talk is in three parts. First, I shall analyse what the reform of old corruption in the 19th century meant in relation to MPs' conduct and ethics. There is a tacit assumption in the secondary literature that civil service reform and parliamentary reform are much the same thing, both aimed at cleaning up public life in Victorian Britain. I think that misses the point as far as MPs were concerned, for they looked for external change rather than altering their own behaviour. Second, I shall argue that one consequence of the transition to democracy in the 19th and early 20th century was that Parliament strengthened its own privileges against outside pressures drilling down on corruption in the electorate. And then thirdly, I will argue that the peculiar system of representation in the UK that persisted until well into the middle of the 19th century, double member seats, the business vote, these sorts of things, despite the age of reform, was based on the representation of interests uh, and not people. And this had the effect, this representation of interests, of normalising close connections between individual MPs and outside interests without either side seeing it as unethical. So let's start with old corruption in Parliament. In the first half of the 19th century, Parliament set about reforming the British state with a gusto seldom seen before or since. Old corruption was rooted out at all levels, in government, at the court, in municipal authorities, in the police, the law courts, in the Church of England, in the empire, and of course, uh, the civil service. By the time Gladstone's first administration of 1868 to 74 began to implement the recommendations of the Northcott Trevelyan Report of, it, of 1854, as we have been hearing, seen as the foundation stone of the modern civil service, even the universities of Oxford and Cambridge had heeded the call for renewal, always a barometer of uh, renewal in the British state when the ancient universities get around to modernisation. That's okay, isn't it? The end of the year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, however, Parliament itself emerged from this age of reform relatively unchanged. That is to say, the ways in which the members of the House of Commons and the House of Lords went about their business did not alter very much. Of course, there was no shortage of criticism of Parliament before the Reform Act of 1832, Critics of old corruption targeted the House of Commons, most of all for being a tool of patronage. John Wade's famous black book, about which Ian has written very well, listed all the sinecures and placeholders supported at the public expense, and it had plenty to say about MPs who were in the pay of undeclared patrons. 
absentee MPs, seats uncontested at election time, nabobs and other nouveau riche politicians all pointed to a system in which the unelected portion of the state, the peerage, the crown, the church, the armed forces enjoyed undue and unethical influence over the people's representatives. Absenteeism was a particular bugbear. The utilitarian Jeremy Bentham, one of his reform pamphlets uh, there on the right of the slide, had an ingenious solution for absenteeism. Make all MPs deposit a sum of £400 with a sergeant at arms at the beginning of each session, from which they would be repaid £2 for each day that they attended Parliament. They would suffer the pain of giving up the money, but enjoy the pleasure of receiving it back. I always get Bentham pain and pleasure mixed up, and my students over many generations have been thoroughly confused. Critics of absenteeism also honed in on colonial lobbies, lobbies that is the West India slave owning elements, the Anglo-Irish landowners, tithe holders, and also the East India Company's lackeys in the commons. Now, insofar as radicals such as Bentham had a solution to all corruption in the commons, it was fairly broad brush. Reform how parliament was elected so that more civic-minded MPs would be returned, free of patronage and devoted to their constituents' needs. So you see the reform of MPs taking place indirectly in two ways. The Reform Act was preceded by opening up the commons to dissenters and Catholics, i.e. those outside the Church of England, and eventually to Jews, and then eventually to people of no faith uh, or, 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 or non-Christian faith. The 1832 Reform Act also made locality the basis of re representation, squeezing out those lobbies, metropolitan elites, and expatriates who knew little and cared less about the constituencies that returned them to the commons. The new electoral laws of 1832 and their subsequent modifications down to 1918 made it much harder for non-resident voters to take part in elections. And this has an indirect impact on the type of candidates coming forward for election. The new electoral system after 1832 prioritized candidates from a local uh, background. The suspicion of the carpet bagger outsider became a common trope of Victorian elections. But besides making Parliament more representative of religion and of the regions, there were no significant alterations in the law relating to MPs in the age of reform. This was partly because some of the old conventions suited modern ways, Time and again in the 19th century, Parliament resisted repealing the various laws that disqualified clergy, serving soldiers, customs officials from eligib eligibility for election to the commons, or in some cases, eligibility to vote, on the grounds that all of those types of people were in the pay of government. In other cases, Parliament preferred to uphold old laws, putting them to new uses. For example, the requirement that any MP appointed to ministerial office and therefore in receipt of a government salary and vulnerable to patronage was required to resign their seat on appointment and stand for by-election that remains in place until the 1920s. Similarly, after 1832, Parliament retained the old, weird property qualification for MPs, which dated from the reign of Queen Anne, because it ensured that county constituencies were not overrun by outsiders, by, by so-called carpetbaggers. Property qualification is repealed in 1858 on the practical grounds that it didn't apply in Scotland and was anyway becoming very difficult to police. Another old law barring government contractors from the Commons hurried into legislation in 1782 during the war with America was deemed fit for purpose until the 1950s, a curious survival to which I will return later in my talk. Conversely, Parliament had no time for modern innovations that might reintroduce state patronage through the back door. For example, payment of MPs, first mooted by the Chartists in 1837, rolled out in some of the British colonies in the 1880s, but kept at arm's length by the UK Parliament until 1911, and even then pegged deliberately low 
by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, he's quite explicit, David Lloyd George, so as not to create the impression that parliamentary service was a route to riches. Heaven forbid. In fact, the only law that changed as far as MPs were concerned during the age of reform came in 1871 when bankrupts were, allowed, were disallowed from standing for, for Parliament, a measure designed to restore confidence following a series of financial scandals, um, railway speculation, bank crashes, through the 40s through to the 1860s. In each case, MPs had been caught up in the mess and Parliament proved determined not to be uh, associated with the fallout, wanting to disqualify men with questionable commercial credentials from managing the public finances. But it's the only substantive reform to the code of ethics relating to MPs. Ironically enough, this particular Victorian uh, regulation was watered down in 1986. Nowadays, discharged bankrupts are welcome in the Commons, although there's no need, I think I'm right in saying, to declare this in the Register of Interests. Now, if Parliament was largely content to leave its own behaviour alone during the age of reform, the same could not be said of, of the behaviour of the electorate, to which I now turn in the second part of my talk. The 1832 Reform Act created one of the most complex and bureaucratic systems of electoral controls ever invented. The registration of electors after 1832, the introduction of the secret ballot, in 1872 and the series of measures culminating in the Corrupt and Illegal Practices Act of 1883 left Britain one of the most policed electorates in the world. Let us recall how adult males in the boroughs qualified for the vote during the period between 1832 and 1918. There was only one vote per household. The Household had to have a rateable value, the property of at least £10 per year, that the monetary threshold was dropped later on. The householder needed to prove residence of at least 12 months and also give proof of payment up to date of local rates within the last three months. Electoral registers were published so the names of eligible voters could be challenged. Indeed, the first local political parties that emerged in the 1830s in Lancashire are set up specifically to challenge names appearing, they argued, from the opposite party, uh, er erroneously in the register. A whole new branch of the legal profession, the revising barrister, this is an interesting cartoon, there's lots going on, I'll come back to it, but it's, 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 it's the only time Punch depicts a revising barrister, although as a Shakespearean character, the, the revising barrister emerged to check and authorise these lists of voters. So as a result, there was a huge gulf between those who were entitled to vote, those whose names were approved, and those who actually voted. A modern day comparison would be with some of the southern states of the USA, where the process of voter registration has become deeply uh, politicised. This hostile electoral environment in the UK effectively disenfranchised millions and was only swept away in 1918 by the need to assemble an electorate very quickly so no limit was placed on the length of residence in time for the khaki election, the Lloyd George election, the coupon, uh, sorry, the khaki coupon election at the end of the war. Why was this so? Why were the rules surrounding the voter, particularly voter registration, so exacting? In short, Parliament distrusted democracy. The age of reform in Britain took place against the backdrop of revolution elsewhere. Wary of lobbying, of rule by the mob, of the commons, being overwhelmed by demagogues, Parliament took steps to constrain and control the unpredictable electorate it had created. This Frankenstein scenario has been well described in a series of classic studies by Franco Gorman, James Vernon and, and Patrick Joyce, to whom uh, Ian alluded earlier on. Each extension of the franchise down to 1928 was accompanied by restrictions on who could vote and how. It's been calculated by the historian of Parliament, Philip Salmon, that there were some 40 separate acts passed in the decade after 1832 aimed at tidying up the machinery of voter representation and polling. The secret ballot of 1872, five years 
after the Second Reform Act is perhaps the best example of electoral reform as an act of policing, brought in to stem the influence of election time of the Catholic Church in Ireland and cleanse vote rigging in municipal elections in England, many commentators saw the secret ballot as an invasion of people's liberty, hence the ballot box muzzling the voter, as in this picture. The idea was open voting without the ballot was an honest English way of expressing your political opinion. The problem with the vote in the compartment or the, the ballot was that you um, exercised your opinion privately without any of the, of the wider functions of citizenship, taking notice of what other people thought. We can see a similar process of uh, narrowing of rights with women's suffrage. Although giving the vote to women in parliamentary elections was never really on the legislative agenda before the early 20th century, and the, 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 the cartoon on the left um, shows the revising barrister uh, uh, refusing to allow the name of Lily Maxwell, a, Lanc a Lancashire lady who on paper qualified for the vote, to, to cast her vote in, in 1868. But Parliament did concede the right of women to vote in local government elections after 1870, but not for long in London, the largest local government area in the country. Successively, legal challenges denied women the local government vote in the capital until 1907. Even in 1918, when women over 30 gained the right to vote at elections, unless they were married and their husband qualified for the vote, they had to satisfy the old qualification of occupying a house of a rateable value of at least five pounds. So single women, the so-called flapper vote, were, were discriminated against by the 1918 Act. In other words, wherever we look down the long road to universal suffrage in the UK, we see a lack of trust in the people on the part of the British state, an assumption that the elector and not the elected was more likely to act uh, unethically and um, I mean the the, the uh, corrupt and illegal practices the bribery legislation of the 19th century can be understood in similar terms Parliament moves from before 1832 being preoccupied with the the MP as vulnerable to bribery I think this is the cover of your it is. book sorry about that that's right um, to a preoccupation with the electorate as being the, the, in, in a kind of pathological condition of waiting to be bribed and indeed the most heinous offence that an MP can commit to this day is to have been convicted of electoral corruption, corrupting the electorate or malpractice. Any such conviction stays on the record for between three and five years, disbarring anyone from, for standing for election. The uh, Representation People's Act for the People Act of 1981 and 1983 continue the 19th century tradition of drilling down on bribery in the electorate um, uh, without you know, any controls that have been brought in to the amount of money that can be raised by national parties. So that the crime is at the level of the local election rather than the national electoral campaign. And so we can observe a pattern emerging across the 19th and 20th centuries. At the same time as the franchise was expanded across the four nations, Parliament had extended its own privileges and its own status as a quasi-judicial authority. Whilst the behaviour of the electorate outside Westminster might be chaotic, it was volatile, inside all was well ordered. To take a further example, the case of petitioning Parliament, about which we now know so much more thanks to a recent research project based at Durham University. There was a huge increase in petitioning of Parliament uh, after 1830. The anti-slavery movement, the Chartists, the Evangelicals, all turned to mass petitioning as a means of forcing, forcing Parliament into legislation. Pressure from without, as it was known. But the Commons resisted pressure, resisted the petitioners using its standing orders and the decisions of the Speaker to tighten up the rules and dampen down the excitement. Speeches on petitions were limited, then banned. The format of petitions was streamlined so that all signatures had to be verified, usually by attaching the wax seal of the local authority 
from the meeting where the petition came, from where the petition came. Only petitions which related to legislation under consideration by Parliament could be admitted. Any petition that impugned the Commons was struck out straight away. Petitioning was another instance of Parliament trying to put the genie of democracy back into the lamp. The proceedings of Parliament also became more dignified uh, during the 19th century as a way of distinguishing the legislature from the people. The Commons fashioned itself as a chamber of deliberation, free from the ephemeral excitement of the hoi polloi. In the decades after the 1832 Reform Act, Parliament used the old laws, again, of libel and defamation, to shield its work from ridicule and satire. Any journalist reporting on the parliamentary debates needed to be careful not to question or insult the integrity of a sitting MP. The wonderfully named Washington Wilkes, I don't have a picture unfortunately, editor of the Carlisle Examiner was thrown into the cell of the Palace of Westminster in 1857, whilst the Commons considered how to punish him for accusing a member of fraud. Cartoonists might lampoon MPs, but they caricatured them in the Commons at their Herald. Um, so in other words, it, it's, it's unusual to see a caricature of the Commons in the round in the 19th century. Caricatures of individual MPs, um, you will find this is actually from the early 20th century, but you will not find the Commons as a whole, as an institution, being ridiculed in, in the way it had been, for example, in the, in the great age of caricature, late 18th, early 19th century. And we can see legacies of this in-camera uh, ethos uh, um, later on. In the late 20th century, Parliament was slow to let the broadcast media into the Commons um, and the Lords, despite the reconstructed building being completely wired for sound recordings when it was rebuilt after the Second World War, after the Blitz. Even when the cameras were switched on in 19... 89, they, they, they did not and they cannot do what the cameras can do in this room, which is follow the Commons around, around the chamber, follow the MPs around the chamber. They have to focus on the actual uh, speaker. Moreover, under UK law, televised content from the Commons cannot be broadcast in other formats except as news items. So on American satirical shows, you can see recordings of, of the Commons at work, but you won't find equivalents uh, in the UK. And there's a whole separate article or a book really to be written on parliamentary satire and the ways in which it works and doesn't, doesn't work compared to other countries. The Palace of Westminster is and was off limits from popular scrutiny. Sometimes it's been a place where the normal law of the land did not even apply. I found this amazing document in the National Archives last summer. In 1889, the Metropolitan Police were reminded by the sergeant at arms that no MP could be arrested within the environs of the Palace of Westminster. A convention that was only clarified a century later to cover civil, not criminal, offences. So for, on, on paper, for a very long time, Parliament was a place of refuge, a place of uh, sanctuary. In these ways, Parliament has not only been the source of legislation, it's been a law under itself, hence my title. David Howarth, the historian of constitutional law, has forcefully argued that Lex Parliamentaria has created a thicket of protection around Westminster, at times difficult to comprehend and impossible to penetrate. So whilst Parliament preserved its privileges in the face of demos, it also facilitated the legislative, legislative needs of the nation. And this takes me to the third and final part of my talk, how the public and private interest, these notions, have their own conceptual history, or as I must now call it, working in the EU, you remember the EU, uh, or Begriffsgeschichte, uh, conceptual history across the last 250 years. We shouldn't be too misled by the ideal associated with Edmund Burke that MPs exist above the petty and parochial demands of their constituents. In a speech of 1774, with which you are no doubt familiar, Edmund Burke declared to the electors of Bristol that, quote, Parliament is not a Congress of ambassadors from different and hostile interests, which interests each must maintain as an agent and advocate 
against other agents and advocates, that Parliament is a deliberative assembly of one nation with one interest, that of the whole, where not local purposes, not local prejudices, prejudices ought to guide, but the general good resulting from the general reason of the whole. On the contrary, many historians of the unreformed Parliament, that's Burke's era, have shown exactly the opposite. MPs did serve a range of interest groups and lobbies within and beyond their own constituency through indirect connections of residents and family, as well as via their financial and professional networks. And there's a whole body of work. Julian the late Paul Langford, Julian Hoppet, Joanna Innes, a very fine book coming out soon from Michael McCahill, which looks at this in the long 18th century, uh, you know, how, how MPs are virtually representing the interests of the country. Now, as far as the Victorians were concerned, this was a representative system left over from the Middle Ages, which mostly suited their purposes. They considered the lack of uniformity, lack of evenly distributed constituencies, equal sized electorates, they, they considered that to be a guarantee of fairness. For example, enfranchising the relatively small river port of Sunderland in 1832 meant that the shipping industry in other parts of the country was represented. Disfranchising tiny boroughs in Devon and Cornwall made sense as the region had become an economic backwater. Giving MPs to Brighton down the road from us gets two spanking new MPs, sorry, phrase came out wrongly, uh, um, or Cheltenham ensured that pensioners from the armed services in the East India Company, who predominated in these two watering holes, were a proxy vote for retired service personnel elsewhere. That is the argument that is made for enfranchising those two uh, boroughs in 1832. For Victorians, the distribution of parliamentary constituencies and seats was proportionate to the importance of a particular interest embodying the principle that the commons represented corporate groups or sectors such as agriculture, railways, manufacturing, bankers, rather than individuals or classes. For example, until 1885, the City of London, Britain's financial hub, returned not one, not two, not three, four MPs, although its electorate, the electorate of the square mile, was a middling size with relatively few resident household votes, it was mainly business properties that were enfranchised, the City of London MPs were meant to serve the financial and banking needs, a kind of proxy for the rest of the country. University seats, another form of representation of interests, um, were expanded in the 19th century and again in 1918, uh, down to the election of 1950. Many of these double member constituencies survived, including Brighton, still two members up until the 1950 election, and the City of London. Now, if you read the standard histories, these are referred to as odd survivals of plural voting. My argument is, in fact, that they attest to something else, the persistence of virtual representation and how MPs were expected to have direct links to the interests of their constituencies. In other words, outside interests were supposed to be represented by MPs. That was the whole point of Parliament. Through the Reform Act's Parliament carefully calibrated the territorial distribution of constituencies to ensure that this happened. Far from there being a conflict of interest between a being a member of Parliament and being connected to an economic, corporate or professional organisation, it was expected and encouraged. Details of MPs' directorships, their personal wealth were routinely listed in parliamentary guides and companions, for example, Dodd or, or The Times, a, a sort of creating a sort of Victorian and Edwardian version of LinkedIn. Uh, parliamentary uh, caricaturists, such as Leslie Ward of Vanity Fair, often identified MPs literally by the interests they represented. Here's Watkin, um, Manchester MP, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, identified as um, personifying the railway interest. Uh, here is um, Salmuda, I think, uh, personified as representing iron shipbuilding. There was nothing coy or keeping this quiet. It was uh, explicit. So it comes as no surprise to learn from 
recent quantitative research that MPs were heavily invested in the railway companies of the 1840s, private banks in the 1880s and 1890s, the Lancashire cotton industry of the 1900s. We've got you know, amazing data on all of this now. We also know from other uh, longitudinal studies and data sets that MPs with direct links to slavery, to large landed estates, featured in Parliament over several generations, and that single families monopolised the representation of some constituencies across three centuries. We might read all of this as evidence of corruption, and I'm sure that the quantitative historians will continue to do that. We might see it all as sources of uh, private enrichment at public expense. Alternatively, it may point to a simple truth, that Parliament reformed the representative system mainly to connect better the economic life of the nation to the legislature, rather than to appease the demands of the democracy. <clears throat> For example, it's interesting to note that almost as soon as this whole system that I've been uh, summarizing is swept away substantively in 1918, very different ideas of what Parliament should represent begin to emerge. For example, Sidney and Beatrice's web Socialist Commonwealth of 1920, which talks about separating out a political parliament, constitutional law, that kind of stuff, from a, a social parliament, which would deal with uh, economic <clears throat> and, and um, you know, uh, social matters and, and then also devolve a lot of power to local government. Or Winston Churchill, who came up with a scheme for what he called an economic sub-parliament in 1930. It's also the case that once you move out of this old system, business vote, double member constituencies, virtual representation, the professional lobbyists begin to move in. Uh, Watney and Powell, Mark Roodhouse, my former colleague at York, has, has written very well about this um, lobbyist, the consultants who emerge around the aftermath of the First World War, known as St. Stephen's Intelligence Bureau. It sounds like something out of the, the deep state in 1970s or 1980s America. But anyway, my point is that mediation between business and politics, which had been the hallmark of the representative, the reformed representative system in the 19th century, is now made completely separate from, from the representative system. So rethinking what was meant by outside interests and how they might be represented, I believe, goes a long way to explaining why Parliament was so slow to develop any new rules on financial regulation. Parliament didn't lack guidance on who, because of their connections to the state, was not eligible to stand for Parliament. Even the encyclopedic Erskine May complained of there being far too many special disqualifications to enumerate, which is a bit rich for Erskine May because his book is just one long list of exceptions to every convention you can think of. Most of these special disqualifications were connected with holding an office of public or profit under the crown, and also by convention, MPs were supposed to um, refrain from involvement in any parliamentary business, according to Western May, in which they had a pecuniary interest. And as already mentioned, the Act of 1782 stretches into the mid 20th century, preventing MPs from being government contractors. Nothing changes until 1957, when the archaic 18th century conventions on, on offices of profit and contracting were abolished. Why at that particular point in time? Why do we wait until 1957? Well, the official line, according to the note written for Cabinet two years earlier by Gwilym Lloyd George, yes, the Lloyd Georges always pop up in the long history of <laughs> corruption, but anyway, um, it, it's, it's the Home Secretary in 1955 who says we need to change this law, it's chaotic, it's illogical. Many people were being disqualified from becoming MPs because they held position, because these, these, these positions existed in the 18th century, but they don't exist anymore, or they're not, they're not funded in the same way anymore. Whatever the reason, and the old laws, the old conventions are abolished, 1957 is a turning point as Parliament entered an era of no controls whatsoever on MPs' financial interests. Even the old uh, laws are got rid of, the old codes are got rid of. 
Arguably, with the expansion of public sector contracts, particularly during the building boom of post-war reconstruction, you probably wanted these more laws more than ever. Especially when you bear in mind that a very large number of MPs, around one-fifth of the commons in the post-war years, were now on the government payroll. In other words, Lloyd George unwittingly uh, creates the ingredients for a perfect storm. A lot of public contracts out there a lot of uh, MPs with particular connections to central government. Uh, an important recent article by uh, Peter Scott brings out very clearly how the roots of the Paulson affair of 1972 lay precisely in these unreg unregulated pork barrel relationships struck between local politicians, building firms, and a handful of MPs with cabinet connections in the 1960s. I really, it's, it's a brilliant piece of uh, investigative research and, and, and I think it deserves a wider readership. Anyway, I've talked far too long, sorry about that. A few thoughts by way of conclusion. If the high public standards upheld by the modern civil service are a legacy of the age of reform in the 19th century, even if we might want to disagree when that begins, then so too are the murkier ethics of Parliament. This is why uh, history matters when we think about current policy. In my talk today, I've, I've attempted to explain this divergence between a, a reforming ethos around the civil service and the retention of the status quo uh, as far as the Commons was concerned. Wary of democracy, the House of Commons strengthened its own powers whilst diluting the force of the electorate. In an age of reform, Parliament also stuck to old conventions which mixed up the public and the private interest in ways in which we find, now find very difficult to comprehend. We inhabit a different world. And it's clear from recent polling that the public expects better in, in, in the modern day, better behaviour from MPs than politicians more generally. Um, integrity accounts for more than delivery. This is one of the findings of the UCL Constitution Unit report earlier this, this year. In other words, integrity in politicians is deemed more crucial for voters than the delivery of, of, of policies and legislation. Does the new regula regulatory framework create these conditions where MPs are subject to more, uh, more control, more monitoring? Well, there are positive signs, of course. The IPSA is making uh, a difference. The new recall law, whereby constituents can petition to replace MPs convicted of an offence or a breach of code of conduct, gives power back to the voters. Incidentally, in the 19th century, a lot of constituents had that power uh, uh, anyway and, and, and used it. For um, example, you know, Winston Churchill was thrown out by the good voters of Oldham, I think, in 1900. Uh, five um, for, for, for not for breach of code, but because they didn't like him anymore. But developments in the last 20, 12 months also suggest a rather different and a rather worrying direction of travel. The current plans to bring in digital voter identity return us to the days of complex registration, where the onus was on the voter, not the MP, to prove their eligibility. And of course, she. She is entitled to the vote, but she doesn't exercise it. Isn't that the, it's the part of the royal prerogative? Um, ethical watchdogs such as the Electoral Commission are falling out of favour with a government uh, keen to date, take back control, whatever that phrase means. And of course, as we speak, the four guys and girls of Partygate seem likely to be the civil servants and not the politicians. In many ways, Parliament remains the problem and not the solution. Thank you all very much for listening.